Carlos is our, our membership chair. So thank you, everyone. This is a, I'm looking forward to this webinar this morning. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Dr. Gleb, how do you want to handle questions uh, before we get started? Do you want to handle that in the I'll, chat? Uh, I'll handle them at the end. So okay. everyone should put their questions into chat as you have them. And then at the end, we'll get to the questions. I find that I often answer questions in the process of speaking. So that's why I usually don't take questions in the middle. All right, perfect. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to you and you can give us a little bit of your background as well as then starting the session. Uh, I thought you had the introduction, on, uh, but we all right. Yep. Okay, great. So welcome everyone. Let's talk about return to the office for my background. I have over 21 years of experience in future proofing, helping organizations figure out how to adapt to an increasingly disrupted future. And I have been in a combination of academic background and practical business background. So like I said, since 1999, I've been doing this. That's over two decades, consulting, coaching, and training in businesses of various sorts, as well as nonprofit organizations and municipalities. That that's kind of one part of my background. The other part of my background is academic. I've spent over 15 years in academia. I've got a PhD in the history of behavioral science at UNC Chapel Hill. And then I taught as a professor for seven years at the Ohio State University in the Decision Sciences Collaborative and History Department. That's kind of a duality of my backgrounds. And what we'll be talking about is relevant to both the science and the real world experience. So you'll see what I mean when we get to the presentation about the scientific aspect of things. That's kind of one part of things. The other part is that I'm a really well-known thought leader around the world. I published seven books. And so a couple of them are global bestsellers, including this one, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And this one, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Bias and Build Better Unconscious Cognitive Biases and Build Better Relationships. They've been translated into languages and published in languages like Chinese, Korean, Russian, Polish, German, and others. I also have over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. And just a couple of days ago, another one of my articles came out in Fortune, then another one in Scientific American and something in Psychology Today. I also have articles in places like Inc. Magazine, Fast Company, CNBC, CBS News, USA Today, many other places like this. So well-known, highly published. I've been doing this for a long time. I'll be happy to take questions, but that's so that you, as we go along, put them into the chat. If you want questions about my experience, I'll be happy to talk about that as well, but we'll be talking about the presentation, the content. So you know, you can know that I'm highly credible on this topic. I recently published a book called Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and remote teams, benchmarking the best practices for competitive advantage. So that's my book on this topic. You'll be able to get a copy of it if you wish, I'm not selling the book. It's again, it's something that you, if you want, you will be able to get a copy without any cost to you as part of the chapter's payment for my presentation. So that's just so you know, and that's one of my books. That's the latest one. I've helped by now 17 companies and nonprofits transition successfully back to the office and figure out their future of work transition. So hybrid teams, remote teams, including a number of Fortune 500 companies, like a recently a Fortune 200 high-tech manufacturing company. Right now I have an 18th client, which is a large research institute of several hundred people, I'm actually doing a series of trainings for them on this topic, have day trainings beginning on Monday. So that's gonna be quite a lot because it's two weeks of nearly every day having those, yeah, every day, every other day having those trainings. So that's gonna be a little bit intense, but that's my background. That's what I do. I consult, I train, I coach, and I'll be happy to talk about it and I write and present. So that's my background. Now let's talk about the topic itself, returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams for you as payroll professionals. What we'll be focusing on in the first part of the presentation is some data on this topic. So how do you do this effectively? What's some data around benchmarking to external surveys? So how do we know what the external context is? Then some of the errors we tend to make 
pick when we approach returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams. That's going to be the first part of the presentation. The second part of the presentation will be some best practices on leading hybrid and remote teams in the return to the office. That's the shape of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate and look forward to. All right, without further ado, let's dive in. So you've probably heard a lot of people, a lot of leaders say that people are our greatest resource. People are our greatest resource. It's a well-known phrase, frequently used. Unfortunately, you see many leaders really failing to live up to that principle. Many people, many leaders are very comfortable with in-office culture. That's what they want. That's what they prefer. That's how they've been successful for 20, 30 years in their experience. And they want to turn back the clock to January 2020, to times before the pandemic, those golden halcyon days when we didn't know what COVID was and we were just working all the time in the office and that was normal and regular. And very many people just want to get back to that. They feel that they're successful, that their company, their nonprofit, whatever, their municipality is successful that way. And they deny the reality of the major disruption that happened and really continues to happen because of the pandemic. And the fact that we've really fundamentally shifted our values, practices, norms, habits in such fundamental ways, including about how we work and how we collaborate. And they kind of deny that. And they say, well, no, we're gonna just go back to the previous ways of doing things. So that is something that you really frequently see around going back to the office. I'm curious if that's something that you ever experienced. So we'll, we'll, I'll want you to think about that, if that's something that you ever experienced, these kind of leaders in your organization. So just think about that. And as you go through the context of this presentation, because that will be relevant as we go forward. Now, what these leaders don't realize, unfortunately, is that this opportunity to go back to the office is not the kind of super major threat pain point that they want to force everyone to go back to the office, to go back to doing things that they were in January 2020. That is not a good way of approaching this transition back to the office, transition to figuring out the future of work, even if it's not necessarily in the office. So this transition, as we're getting out of the pandemic, hopefully within the next year, COVID will stop being a pandemic and it will become an endemic. So just like the flu is endemic and we, yeah, unfortunately still kills some people per year, but it's not nearly as bad as COVID as uh, it was you know, 1918, that flu pandemic. So the COVID will hopefully eventually with enough vaccination as well as some antiviral treatments like the one that Merck looks like, looks like it's coming out with will hopefully become endemic. So that transition to the future of work needs to be seen as a really major opportunity. And that's an opportunity to maximize, product, to maximize Productivity and engagement and retention. These are things that you want to maximize and focus on. And so we want to be thinking about how do you maximize that effectively? To do that, you need to put aside those assumptions about how people work together best, those habits, those preferences, even your own preferences, because your own preferences may not be indicative of what is best for your organization, for your team. What you wanna do is focus on the objectives, the outcomes, what you want to actually accomplish, the productivity, engagement, retention, and put aside what you personally feel comfortable with. And so you wanna overcome decision-making cognitive biases about this future of work. We'll talk about what they are, but just the, so that you know this kind of the preposition, you want to overcome these cognitive biases and you want to integrate best practices on innovative work arrangements. So that we'll be talking about that in the second half of the presentation on these innovative work arrangements. Now, let's talk about the data, the data on what is actually the best practice. So there are eight major independent surveys that were done on this topic. And from venues like the Harvard Business School, the Society for Human Resource Management, so independent organizations, highly credible, that don't have a stake in the outcome. What they find is that 75 to 85% of workers, depending on the survey, and these are, by the way, surveys done already in 2021, in spring, summer 2021. So they're indicative of people knowing that there are vaccines and transitioning back 
knowing that there's going to be that transition. So not something back in early part of the pandemic when people didn't know what was, talk, what was going to happen. This is after people experienced a year plus of remote work for the about half of all of Americans who can work remotely. Now, so 75 to 85 percent of workers, those who can work remotely, wanted substantial remote work. That's at least half the time. 25 to 35 percent wanted full-time remote work in these surveys. 40 to 55 percent, this is really important, would leave their job if forced to come in full-time. So this is a very big problem, of course, and this is why you're seeing the great resignation being such an issue that huge numbers of Americans are leaving their jobs. The last number we have from the, Depart from the Department of Labor is in is from August. And we know that 4.3 million people voluntarily left their jobs. That's more than ever occurred throughout American history, that many people leaving their jobs. And that's a huge proportion of the workforce actually voluntarily leaving their jobs. So over 75% said that they would be less likely to leave if offered substantial remote work. And so that's really important to keep in mind. Now, we also know that remote employees are more productive. On average, during the pandemic, during the lockdowns, they work 20 hours more per month. Well, why is that? Well, they didn't have to do the unpaid labor of the commute. The commute is a huge issue. I mean, you're Long Island, right? You know that. The, I grew up in New York City. My parents live in Long Island. So around uh, there, they live not far from JFK. So in, to get to the city, my mother works as a psychiatrist. So to get to the, the city where she works as a psychiatrist, it takes her something, I mean, depending on traffic, right? At least one and a half hours, sometimes more than that. So because she has to do the rush hour commute and that on the one and a half hours there, one and a half hours back, that's three hours of unpaid labor per day, right? That's not great. So people are happy to do more work if they don't have to do the unpaid commute extra labor. Over 75% report higher or equal productivity. This is huge. I mean, very many on the large amount per proportion of people are way more productive at home, equally are way more productive. Employees, on the other end of productivity, is the cost of productivity. Employees would take 5 to 15% pay cuts, so 8% on average, for substantial remote work. And that's important for you as payroll professionals to be thinking about that. Now, I'm not suggesting you, uh, you cut the salaries of folks, but that's an indication of people's commitment to it and willingness to leave a job for a lower paying job if they get substantial remote work. Now, that is the data. Before we go to the cognitive biases, I want to ask you yourself, what is your preferred working style after the pandemic has passed? Which of these would you want to do? So please go ahead and vote. Would you want to have a fully remote working style coming in once a quarter, one day in the office, two days in the office, three days in the office, four days in the office, full time? So go ahead and vote, please. see that oh, for three quarters participate, I'll give you five more seconds. Make your voice heard. All right, great. So we see from these breakdowns that we're pretty representative of the general population. Nearly a third would want fully remote, which is what we see. And then about a fifth would want one day in the office, a fifth would want uh, two days in the office and a quarter when one three days in the office. Less than six percent, less than 10 percent, so six percent would want full-time schedule. So we can see that this population of the people here would even prefer more substantial work than the average, substantial remote work than the average population would. So this is really telling and significant. All right, let's go on to talking about how we make bad decisions, how leaders make bad decisions about the future of work. And we're gonna be talking about these things called cognitive biases. And these are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brain is wired. So unfortunately, 
our brain is not wired for making good decisions in the modern environment. Our brain is actually wired. I mean, the modern environment with the internet, with or the way that we collaborate has really been around since the 1990s. And even if we talk about remote work, it's been around since what, I mean, a couple of years ago, our brain has not had time to adapt to this. Our brain has evolved, the evolutionary process is incredibly slow. So the, our evolutionary background, what we're evolved for is the ancient savanna environment. When we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. So that's what the brunt of our evolutionary background is for. For when we're talking about things like how we feel, our preferences, our emotions, our gut reactions, those that tribal environment, 50 to 150 people, when we're hunters, gatherers, and foragers, having to rely on the fight or flight response as our main response to threats and external stimuli, stimuli. So this is a big, big challenge for us that we make bad decisions about the future of work. We're not evolved for it. And so be, we have these problems in our decision-making capacity because of tribalism. Tribalism is our desire to look for people who share our values, have the same preferences, beliefs, thoughts, our tribe, and be hostile to those who don't, to the out tribe. And that is a big, big problem. And the Savannah environment was great because it enabled us to survive. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. And if we were not sufficiently hostile to other tribes, well, they take over our tribe and we die as well. We're the descendants of those who didn't die. We're the descendants of those who had a very strong tribal instinct and who had a very strong fight or flight reflex. Otherwise, again, they would die, our ancestors, our ancestors would die, we're the descendants of those who didn't die. So as a result, in the modern world, you know, it's very difficult to be tribal, to have that sort of tribal reflex and make the best decisions. We have the tribalism inbuilt in us, we have to overcome it. We live in a multipolar global environment and it's not a good idea to be tribal in the modern world, but our intuition still pulls us to be tribal just because of how our brain is wired. And our intuition still pulls us to have that fight or flight reflex, even though we have many less in the moment immediate threats in our daily environment. And we really should be taking much more time to think about our decisions. So that is a, results in a series of problems our evolutionary background, as well as just more broadly, the structure of our brain. These problems are called cognitive biases. And this is what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, these decision-making cognitive biases and the future of work. A subset of these cognitive biases is especially important for the future of work. The biggest one that I've seen be a serious problem for the return to the office issue is called the status quo bias. The status quo bias. We have an intuitive desire to get back to or maintain what we perceive as the status quo. Now, leaders who have been successful in being in the job or in the office for 20 years, 30 years, they have a preference for a status quo of being in the office. That's what they're comfortable with. That's what they like. That is where they feel that they are successful. And so they go with their comfort zone. They go with what they know, even though it's not the best thing for the organization. They downplay these major disruptions from the pandemic. So the status quo bias causes a lot of leaders to be making bad decisions around returning to the office. So that's one, status quo bias. Another one is called the normalcy bias. So normalcy bias, where we greatly underestimate the likelihood and the threat of major disruptions. That's understandable. So in the status quo bias, for example, it goes back to the pandemic. So there's the normalcy, I'm sorry, the status quo bias goes back to the Savannah environment. So in the Savannah environment, it was really important for us to maintain what we had because it was such a precarious environment. If there were changes, we were unlikely to survive effectively. So survival favored those who wanted to get back to the status quo and pushed for the status quo. So that is a reason for the status quo bias as, as far as we know from our evolutionary heritage is kind of the best explanation for it that we have of the status quo bias as such. And the normalcy bias also relates back to that Savannah environment. In the Savannah environment, things were unlikely to be disrupted in a major way in a continuing situation. Now, the kind of 
changes you had were summer, spring, fall, winter, these seasonal changes. That was the context, that was the change of the context. You weren't likely to have significant major disruptions that changed your environment for a long time permanently. So we are not wired to be able to effectively estimate the likelihood and the impact of serious major disruptors, ones that fundamentally change our environment going forward, because we feel that things will continue to go normally. And so we underestimate those impacts, like the impacts from the pandemic. So that normalcy bias is really dangerous for that reason. One of the problems, obviously, is long tail variants. So the long tail risks, of course, refers to risks that are low likelihood by high impact. So that's what the long tail risks refers to. So variance is the major issue that we've been seeing as something with a long tail risk. We know that vaccine effectiveness against Delta goes down pretty seriously. After six months, Pfizer is down to 39% against Delta from research in Israel and elsewhere, which is why we have the booster shots coming out right now. And this new Delta Plus variant, you might have heard of it. It's more resistant to vaccines. It's spreading in the Bay Area and 11 countries. So that might be a next variant of concern, serious concern, and other variants are spreading. So we tend to underestimate the impact and the disruption, both of the pandemic itself, of course, and things like the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis and other disruptors. I mean, the rise of the smartphone has changed, caused a lot of disruption. But we also underestimate the, the risk of other variants. Many companies are hope are thinking, well, okay, Delta is a one-time thing. They're underestimating the likelihood of other variants. For risk management and company culture, it would be really beneficial to keep some people always virtual, always remote, so that a company has systems and processes that enable it to go remote at any minute. And you have some people who are constantly remote to provide backup to people who are doing hybrid schedules, even some full-time if that has to happen. So you want all, all to be able to go fully remote on short notice, and you want some to be full-time remote at all times in order to provide that those systems and processes and risk management. So that's a normal bias. Now, functional fixedness is another huge issue. So functional fixedness has to do with our inability to adapt effectively to a different situation because we have learned to collaborate, to work together in certain ways that are quite problematic. So functional fixedness, well, you might have heard of this as the hammer nail syndrome. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You might have heard of that phrase. Well, when you have a way of collaborating, you, when you have one way of functioning together, then you perceive that as the only right way. And thus, in March 2020, what happened? Well, there was the lockdowns. And so the leadership overwhelmingly imposed their in-office culture way of collaborating on hybrid slash remote work. That's fine for a week, for two weeks. But as the pandemic dragged out, it was very clear that we were going to be in this four months and we're ending up, it's, it's been over a year and a half and it will be probably over a year by the time the pandemic becomes endemic. So this is a very bad idea to not adapt to the virtual fully remote work setting. But leaders didn't do that overwhelmingly. From companies I talked to, from surveys, overwhelmingly what happened was that they imposed their in-office ways of collaborating on these personal on these uh, on the remote work, and they didn't adapt strategically to this new way of collaborating, innovating anywhere to innovate anywhere and collaborate everywhere. And so this is a big problem that we see around the future of work. All right. Now I'm going to ask you which of these three, ignore the C and D. So ignoring C and D because we didn't talk about them and I will, that would be a longer version of my presentation to have day one. Which of these cognitive biases do you think might be most problematic 
for the return to the office in your workplace out of the status quo bias, normalcy bias, and functional fixedness. Please vote. So if most of you participated, I'll give you five more seconds. Those who didn't vote yet. Okay, so we see that there's a tie. So somebody accidentally pressed C, but there's a tie between status quo bias and functional fixedness. And status quo bias is the biggest problem I see with deciding in policies for going back to the office and trying to stick into the status quo. Functional fixedness is the biggest problem I see in terms of how do you actually adapt to going back to the office and figuring out what is the future of work transition going to look like. So we'll talk about that right now. All right, what are the best practices that exist for a seizing a competitive advantage in the future of work? We're thinking about these issues around productivity, engagement, retention, morale, well-being, all of these sorts of issues. What are the best practices for these going forward? The best is a team-led model. So I've seen a lot of organizations make the mistake of dictating a hybrid policy from the top. So for example, Amazon went ahead and said, oh, the, these are the days that everyone will come back to the office. And that was a serious problem. And you had a lot of pushback from people at Amazon where people figured out, okay, I don't need to be in the office and why should I come back on this set schedule when it doesn't work for everyone? It's a very problematic issue and model. So there was a lot of pushback by the staff and of course, and a number of people resigned as part of the great resignation because of this forced approach to returning people to the office in a dictatorial authoritarian top-down fashion. And eventually on June 10th, Amazon had to announce that it screwed up and it's going to change its policies to be much more flexible toward worker desires. Now that, of course, is what it should have done from the beginning. It wouldn't have lost many billions of dollars in top talent leaving, which, you know, to hire top tech talent and replace them takes a great deal of money. And of course, a number of challenges it had in its productivity and engagement and morale from people who remained but were pissed. And then from changes that it made to its office space in anticipation of this return, which didn't occur. So this is a huge trillion dollar company, huge company that's making these bad decisions. And you see other trillion dollar companies making these bad decisions. Same thing happened with Google. Google faced worker rebellion and then May 5th announced that it, okay, it screwed up and it's going to change its policy, allow up to 20% of its workforce to be fully virtual, others to work from any office they want rather than the main campus where they previously worked and so on. So this is something you see in another trillion dollar company and they are making really bad decisions. So this is something that happens at the very top level. So they're making bad decisions and they're losing billions of dollars. I'm guessing most of you work in companies where billions of dollars would be difficult to lose. So this is not something you want to see happen. The best approach, the best practice on returning to the office is a team-led model, meaning that you let the supervisors, the lower level supervisors of each individual six to eight people team make the decision for what works best for their team after giving them some training on these cognitive biases and best practices and allowing them to integrate and practice these modalities in their workplace. So this is a team led model approach. This is what you really wanna be going forward. You want most people, generally speaking, to be hybrid first. And we see that from the data that most people want to be hybrid. A minority want to be fully remote and you want to allow that. That's definitely beneficial for your engagement and recruitment, risk management, and so on. So 25 to 35% want to be 
quality mode, something like 50-60% want to be hybrid and only something like 10 to 20%. We see in this group under 10%, 6%, I think it was, want to be in the office full time. So this is something for you to be thinking about, this hybrid first model with a minority full remote. And this is something for team leads to be making decisions around whether they want their team to be fully remote and you don't want, it depends on the team and it depends on the kind of collaboration that they need to do. So hybrid employees spend one to three days in the office with a majority, that's the majority, 70 to 90%. That's, that's what you want to orient toward. And it really depends on which end of the spectrum and collaboration you are. So for example, the, the Fortune 200 company I finished, I mentioned that oh, I finished my engagement in, that's a high tech company. So they have some people who simply need to be in the office at least some of the time. I mean, some people need to be in the, in the office on the shop floors uh, some the, all the time because they're doing production. A number of people are engineers and technicians, scientists who need to be in the office to use various equipment at least some of the time. And so they are having an outcome of, I think, something like around 12% of people being fully remote and the rest hybrid or that minority who are full time in the office. And fully virtual employees, those fully remote people, so minority 10 to 30%. You know, if you're in the service profession and if you're not in the production, for example, you want it to be closer to 30%, just representative of your workforce, whoever wants to go fully remote. And you want to adopt best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements, which we'll be talk talking about next. Now, before these team leads, these people managers make a decision on returning to the office, you want to provide them with some training. And that is going to be really important for their success and your success in returning to the office. What kind of training do they want need to have? They need to have the training on the cognitive biases in the future of work, status quo bias. I mentioned, I mentioned the normalcy bias, I mentioned functional fixedness. All of those need to be areas that they're trained on. And you'll have this training, so you'll have this context. You'll also be getting a book on this topic, so you can be able to access that and share that around within your company if you would wish. And you want best practices for hybrid and remote work arrangements, which we'll be talking about right now. One of the best practices is to have that team-led approach. And then you want to, them to make a decision on hybrid work, the in-office part of the time that people spend, that one to three days, based on the amount of collaboration that the team has to do. So look at the amount of collaboration, because when you look at productivity, people are way more productive on their individual tasks at home. Overwhelmingly, they are much, much more productive on their individual tasks when they're working at home. On their team tasks, it's more of a wash. Some of them are more productive in the workplace, some in the office on their collaborative tasks when they're collaborating with others. Some of them are more productive in home and actually also depends on team dynamics and personalities and the nature of the tasks. But productivity is way more higher when people are working on their individual tasks at home for most people. And it's understandable. It's a quiet environment. It's a comfortable environment. They have it set up the way they like. They don't have disruption, nearly as many disruptions from the office environment. So it's a much better environment for most people to be doing their individual tasks. So you want to establish a default of one day a week, generally speaking for hybrid workers. For those who aren't fully remote, having a default of one day a week, no more. And the default is good enough for cohesion collaboration for most people. So that's why you want the default. You don't want more than the default for most people. And you have the people managers, those team leads, those supervisors, justify any additional days in the office. So you want them to submit a plan. So the team leads would submit a plan to HR to make sure that their timing is equitable and justifies any additional time in the office based on the amount of collaboration they have to do in order to overcome those cognitive biases that team leads do suffer from as leaders. So that's one dynamic. The next dynamic is reshaping office space. 
So you want to work a lot on this. This is a really important area. You don't want to simply people to come back. This is a very, very pr problematic aspect of functional fixedness when people just come back and they say, well, let's let's go back and work in our previous work arrangements. That's, that's really not going to cut it because your work will be overwhelmingly collaborative. So when people are in the office, it will be a collaborative activity. So the first step is you want to get information from team leaders and plans for an office work. And that's going to be after they learn about cognitive biases and after they learn about best practices for hybrid and remote work and after they have some time to experiment. So there should be a period of transition. And what I recommend my clients do is have a couple of months of transition after the team leads get training on decision-making cognitive biases and on hybrid and remote work so that they have some practice with it and see what their team likes, what they like. And then over time, then have a longer period of transition of so having that practice, submit those plans, and then have some more flexibility for changing their plans around as their team needs evolve and as they practice some more. So you want to get info from team leaders on your plans for in-office work at the end of that first two month period. And then based on that, you want to shift your real estate footprint, decreasing it to decrease expenses, of course. This is usually the highest budget line that non-salary uh, related, non-payroll related budget line, the highest budget line is usually real estate expenses. So leasing various office-based services like security and so on, various of office-based products like commercial printers, that is a pretty high amount of company budgets. And that's a well, great opportunity to decrease these budgets. That's really important. And so the next step is decreasing those budgets. After that, you want to, or along with that, you want to change your existing office space to be mostly collaborative. The usual arrangement for companies is to have something like 20% of office space collaborative for collaborative activities, video conference rooms, trainings, event spaces, and then 80% private for people to do their individual tasks. And that's not going to cut it in the future of work because the vast majority of the time that people will be in the office will be for collaborative tasks because they're much more productive on their individual tasks at home and you want them to work at home on their individual tasks. You want to encourage people to work on their individual tasks at home. This you want to create a culture where their individual tasks will be done at home and their tasks that are collaborative. It depends on the situation, the context, but the ones where the team leads decide they're better done in the office, those will be done in the office. And so that involves changing office space. And that change of office space means that you get rid overwhelmingly of private office space, except for team leaders and those who, those who need those private conversations. So, I mean, there's of course needs to be some private space for payroll, for appropriate confidentiality. So various functions like that, but that should be no more than one third of the space. Two thirds of the space should be collaborative. That means video, that means conference rooms, sizable ones you know, for 20 people or so with high tech video conference equipment. Then also boardrooms for smaller groups, maybe up to six, something like that, where people can comfortably sit together and collaborate. And that should also be equipped with video conferencing equipment for those subgroups because some people will be fully remote and they'll need to dial in. And informal lounges for people to collaborate in less formal settings. One of the things that people are lo really looking for in the future of work is those collisions, collaborations together with others. So they can go in the lounge, sit there, do some work. Others can come in, do, make some coffee, chat to them. People are really looking for that social contact. And those informal lo lounges help facilitate that social contact. So that's the office space question. And then funding for home offices. So funding for home offices is a very important part of this dynamic. And this is something you have to be thinking about that the vast majority of people, the large majority of work for your company will be done at home. People who are fully remote will be all remote. And people who are going to be coming into the office, unless you're a manufacturing company or something like that, but here we're talking about the people who are working in the, who are able to work from home. So those people, the vast majority of their work will be done from home because their individual tasks 
are much larger. The usual person, the usual worker, 80 to 90% of their tasks are actually individual tasks. Only something 10 to 20% of their tasks are collaborative tasks. So their individual tasks will overwhelmingly be done from home. That means that your company is now distributed. You know, you'll have of your tasks, again, 25 to 35% of your people will be fully remote. So that's 100% of their tasks done from home. The rest of the people will be coming into the office an average of one to two days a week. And so that means that for those who come in one day a week, 20, 80% of their tasks are done at home. For those who come in two days a week, 60% of their tasks are done at home. That means that you want to create a place in their home that's as product, that is as conducive to productivity comfort, well-being, and quiet as possible. So those four dynamics, productivity, comfort, well-being, and quiet. So you want to use savings from real estate, which you'll have, to fund home offices. The usual funding that I recommend and that my clients generally implement is $3,000, up to $3,000 for the initial transition to a long-term home office, and then $2,000 maintenance for anything over that. And we can talk about the details of what that means. I'll be happy to dive into the numbers. So you want things like an internet connection, high quality internet connection. That's usually, you don't want the usual kind of you know, typical broadband service. You want something that's high, uh, at least 50 megabytes. So you want something that's high, that people are comfortable collaborating with each other using that internet. You want high quality equipment. That means not simply a laptop and a monitor. And you want them to have good video cameras, good lighting, good microphones. Remember, the lighting, the microphones, the video camera, people are really generally not going to get that because it doesn't bother them to have bad lighting, bad video cameras, bad microphones. You know, who it bothers? Their teammates. It impedes your collaboration and communication. All of this stuff is really important for the company to get. Ergonomic furniture, standing desks, comfortable chairs, the for those who needed to the standing of various accoutrements for standing desks of all of these stuff like soundproofing curtains all of these are things that you really want to be getting for people room separators for those who don't have a separate room for their office there are plenty of things that are important for people to get if they're fully virtual or employees you want them to be able to have funding to go work in a in a co-working space somewhere or something like be able to get a little bit of money for going to a coffee shop and work there you know they'd be getting free coffee from the office anyway right so that is something that is very reasonable if they're doing work in a coffee shop for them to be have a certain funding per day for coffee or something like that. So all of these things are funding for their home offices, funding for remote, for the time that they spend working remotely. I'm curious if that will be beneficial to you. So check out the question and please vote if you or any members of your team would benefit from such funding to establish a quiet and comfy office space acquiring quality technology equipment and broadband access. Great, okay. So we have two thirds participating, five more seconds. The rest make your voice heard. Okay, so we see that over 85% of you would benefit, oh, you or your team would benefit from these things. Great. So this is something to bring up, of course, with your leadership and talk about these benefits and something that would be really important, valuable for you. All right. Let's talk about how to adapt your culture effectively to collaboration. So collaboration is one of the biggest challenges for remote work, of course, and for hybrid work. And this is something that you can adapt your culture to. You know, Zoom meeting, Zoom happy hours are famously bad ways of collaborating. The forced meetings are not good ways of collaborating. 
often leaders want to do weekly meetings on Zoom, especially Zoom happy hours where you're supposed to just socialize with people. That has been associated, shown by research to be linked to disengagement, not engagement. So that's really not good. That's the opposite of what you want. Leaders do Zoom happy hours so people can chat and meet each other for the purpose of team engagement, but it causes disengagement. And even weekly meetings with your team, that is not a good way of people spending their time, they're disengaged, that is often harmful and there are much better ways of having that function of facilitating collaboration and team engagement like virtual co-working. And this is an activity that should be done by virtual teams, by people who are working remotely every day and by teams that are hybrid, meaning coming in a couple of days, one or two days a week into the office on the days that they're not coming into the office. So again, every day, that for remote people, every day that they're not in the office for hybrid people. What does, what does that mean? That means that you work alongside your team members on a video conference call. So you all dial in to a video conference call, just much like this one. So Zoom, Microsoft Teams, whatever you're using. And then you simply describe what you're going to be doing. It's gonna be a one hour, two hours. I suggest starting with one hour. And if you like it, if team members like it, you can extend it, but start with, a, with an hour. What you do is you start, everyone starts by sharing the project on which you'll work. This is not for collaborative tasks. This is for your individual tasks. So your individual task, whatever you're doing, this is what this time is for. So you just share, start by sharing the project on which you'll work. And then you want to turn off your microphones, not to distract others, but you want to leave your speakers on so you'll be able to hear if someone has something to say. And the video is optional. Some of you want, may want the video, some of you may not want the video. It depends. I find that more introverted people prefer to have video off, more extroverted people prefer to have video on. It just depends. Then when you have questions or ideas for innovation, that's when you want to turn on your microphone and share your ideas or ask your questions. And so that is why you want to keep your speakers on. And this is really helpful. Then other team members can answer questions, discuss ideas for any changes, innovations. You can even use screen sharing to show someone, someone something to answer their question about payroll issues or other things. And then you end at the end of the hour, then you all turn on your microphones and share what you accomplished on your individual task that you're working on. This is really good for more complex tasks. So I see people in leaving their more complex tasks for this project because complex tasks are where they most often might have questions for their team members. This is especially good for getting team members who are less senior junior team members who have been there for less period of time, especially those who are hired during the remote period. The Fortune 200 company hired, it's a it, high-tech manufacturing, including for semiconductors. And so they had a huge boom in their workforce during the pandemic, like 20% of their workforce. So a lot of people never met each other. So that is especially good for people who didn't meet each other to get engaged with the team and collaborate. It helps teams bond, facilitates innovation on those innovative ideas, and does integration for junior team members. A lot of people complain about, well, we're lost on the job learning. What's on the job learning? That's when you have an opportunity to immediately and easily ask questions of your team members. And this is a great opportunity for that. That's what this virtual co-working is for. So this is really good for having that, replacing that on the job learning, helping teams bond and integrating junior team members. And what I find is that this is really useful, again, for those more complex projects that you want feedback on from your team members. So it even helps senior team members who are working on more complex projects. Now, instead, so that's instead, this is would replace those team meetings, which overwhelmingly are meant to for bonding rather than communication. If you have updates, you can always share them asynchronously. If there's, you should not be having team meetings more than once a month. And once you start doing this, a lot of people are skeptical. They're used to that, you know, Monday meet, team meeting. I can guarantee to you, once you start doing this, the large majority of you will find that that replaces the need for team meetings and all the team updates can be shared asynchronously using Microsoft Teams or Slack or whatever software you're using. And then you can have a team meeting if you want to 
specifically discuss an issue. If you are all virtual, you can have a team meeting in person. Of course, team meetings, for if you do one day a week in the office, will happen in person, which is good. I advocate for team meetings in person one day a week in the office because that does help team bonding and collaboration and those nice hallway conversations. So that's for team meetings. This is for Zoom happy hours and other ways that people are used to trying to create engagement, social engagement with teams. So you want to replace the in-person water cooler functionality of being in the office with a virtual water cooler. You want to create a native digital format for everything. This is why I'm talking about that virtual co-working to replace in-person co-working. You don't want to use the traditional ways of doing things that are adapted from office culture because they're not a good fit for virtual environments. You want to instead have native virtual formats that would facilitate your ability to work together. That virtual water cooler is a great way of doing so. So you want to have a personal channel for each team in your collaboration software. And of course, I'm talking about collaboration software. I'm talking about things like Microsoft Teams and Slack, as I mentioned. So you, and if you're using Mondays or Asana or Trello, with, that's fine for Trello. You, you can just have a card that's personal for whatever it is. So for each team, I'm talking about those teams of six to eight people, the lower level teams. So that if for each teams, and of course, if you're talking about a management team that has, that will still have something like usually six to eight people, maybe up to 10, and you want to have it for that management team, same thing. So you want to have a personal channel for each team in your collaboration software. Each team member has uses that to start your day with a daily sharing. So that's what you want to do. Start your day with a daily sharing. What you want to do is answer, how are you feeling that day? How's your personal life going? A fact about yourself or the world that others may not know and what you plan to work on that day. So this is what you want to do at the start of your day. This takes less than five minutes to write about these things. And that gives people a sense that's kind of the water cooler sort of exchange, personal life, feeling, interesting facts about yourself or the world and your plans to work on that day. And then you want to make sure to engage with others, at least three other people. So respond to three others who do daily sharing earlier with things, with things like responding to their feelings, their personal life, facts, and what you plan to work on that day. And so you respond to three others. And then during the rest of the day, you can use that channel to chat to others. I find that more extroverted people use that more during the day to, to chat with others more. Introverted people don't, and that's fine. The obligatory thing, kind of the morning check-in, is that morning update and response to others. And it's a great tool also for managers who want to make sure their workers are working. But honestly, this is a big anxiety. I've, I've, I've heard about this from so many managers who are anxious about, well, are my people working? Did they sign on? Did they, did something, are they sick? Did something happen to them? They may not know and they may be worried. And this is a great relief for their anxiety as well. And of course, the primary function is that it helps those team members connect on a personal human level that you help that team bonding. All right. Then before doing that, let's do a little poll. So do you think it would be helpful? No, oh, hold on for a sec. Oh, yeah, um, let's, let's do this right now. So do you think it would be helpful for adapting your culture to align with a more hybrid remote work style? Would that be valuable for your workplace? Specifically talking about the collaborative activities that we've talked about so far. Do you think these collaborative activities, the virtual water cooler, the digit, the virtual co-working, would some of those be helpful? Give you five more seconds. Seem large majority of you participated. Five more seconds.
Great. So we see that the, the way the vast majority of you, 95%, think that these would be helpful. That's great. So again, you'll have my book and you'll have the you'll have this training, you'll have had this training, and you can bring this information to your workplace and start instituting these techniques in your workplace. And I'll be happy to chat to those of you afterward. Uh, I, I do a free coaching session for the first three claimants who want to talk to me and help them integrate these techniques into their workplace or with you or with supervisors, leaders at your organization, whatever seems appropriate. Okay, next, revising your performance evaluation. This is a really important car component of making sure that you are able to measure and have accountability. This is something that leaders really worry about, about how do you make sure that you have accountability and evaluate, appropriately evaluate performance for people who are fully remote or for people who are hybrid, you know, they're, they're only one day a week, I can't see them working, right? And leaders are really worried about that. So how do you address this problem? Well, you want to focus on employee deliverables. The typical thing that people do before the pandemic was focusing on amount of time worked. How much do they work? How much do they observe them working? How do I feel about the amount of time they worked? That is what the focus generally was, not huge once annual, once a year evaluation, or maybe quarterly. Now, this is not going to be a good fit for hybrid or remote work. That's, that's a really bad idea. What you want to be focusing on is establishing clear and transparent employee deliverables and focusing on those. So that's what you want to be doing. You want to measure and manage, you probably heard the phrase, what gets measured gets managed. So you want to measure, determine deliverables and measure them at your individual tasks uh, of the individual tasks of the employees, 80 to 90% for most, on their collaborative tasks, how they are doing as members of their team and the quality of their deliverables. So the productivity, how well, how much they're doing and the quality of those things. So this is something to remember. You want to determine and establish that with the supervisor, should, the team lead should establish that with the team members. And then you want to move to small scale weekly evaluations and check-ins rather than the quarterly performance. This is really important for those deliverables because those deliverables tend to not be once a year deliverables. They tend to be frequent deliverables and you should subdivide them into components even if they're large projects. Definitely, that's the way to get large projects done effectively. So you want something that can be measured in weekly evaluations and check-in meetings, or if you can't do weekly, bi-weekly. I would not go any further than once a month. I recommend weekly that has found has been the most helpful for most people who do this, but again, bi-weekly and monthly are possible depending on the structure of the organization. So for example, there is a research institute with which I'm working, that's my current client, has a few hundred people and they are doing monthly just because of the nature of research tasks, the ways that the staff members are working, they have longer chunks of things to work on and they have more autonomy because of the nature of their individual research. So they're doing monthly, but that's rare. I would recommend for most people to do weekly check-ins. So you want small scale weekly evaluations and check-in meetings. Check-in meetings with a supervisor should be 15 to 30 minutes each week. That helps to take care of a lot of concerns and questions that usually take up the more time. So this actually, you find that the supervisor spends less time interacting with each person because they can interact in these Zoom meetings or if it's a hybrid team, definitely recommend doing them in office. So small scale weekly evaluations, what happens in the evaluation? Well, you want to focus on helping ensure those quality deliverables and test your business outcomes. So what happens is that the supervisee, the team member sends the team lead a report of what did they do that their top three to five accomplishments for that week, any challenges they faced, any on how they solve these challenges, what they plan to work, how they grew professionally, what they did for professional development that week, and then what they plan to work on next week, and finally a self-evaluation. 
on whatever scale you use, you know, zero to five, zero, whatever it is. That's kind of in the weeds. But that, those are typical things that you want to do. And you want to have that be compared to the week because each week you have those, so you want to compare them. What did they do? Their top three to five accomplishments against what they committed to doing last week. So that is the process. Then the supervisor, that, that should be sent a couple of days before the meeting. Then the supervisor responds will, by the day before the meeting, by the end of day before the meeting with the response to these things. And then at the meeting itself, they discuss the accomplishments and challenges the supervisor or coaches as needed the supervisee on how to address challenges better in the future going forward. And then they agree or revise their the supervisees plans for accomplishments in the upcoming week. And then they agree or revise on the performance evaluation. And that performance evaluation gets fed into a continuous performance evaluation and improvement and promotion system. That is a way better system than the once annual evaluation based on approximate sense, sense of the evaluate of the evaluator of the team lead on how well and how much the person worked. It also addresses well-being and burnout issues because those check-in meetings are an opportunity for the supervisor to check in on how their employee is doing and to address any potential burnout and well-being issues, which is a well-known issue with people working remotely because if they're working in the office, then the supervisor can see much more if there's burnout issues, if there's mental well-being issues, but if the person is distant, that's much harder to observe. And then, of course, build stronger relationships with the people manager. So when you look at what actually causes people to stay and retention and engagement and productivity, you see that people feel a connection to company culture overwhelmingly through their manager. About 60 to 70 percent of people's connection to the company, culture, organization, and just loyalty to the workplace comes due to their people manager. So this is huge. And this is really important to address. Okay. Now, given this performance evaluation, do you think you would advocate revising performance evaluation in your office to align with this more hybrid remote work style? Would that be valuable? See that nearly three quarters of you participated. I'll give you five more seconds. Great. So we see that hundred percent totally think that this would be really this would be valuable for your workplace. So again, you will be able to take this information back to your workplace, and you'll be able to share about this with your leadership team and so on, whoever makes the decisions on these. Now, I, oh, this is something that I want to mention just to highlight that the relationship between employee and people manager is key. So this is really important for integration, retention, engagement, morale, and productivity. Let's talk about this. Now, training. This is something you really want to train your people on. So I'm doing a training right now. You want to give similar trainings to your teams, to your supervisors, and to their supervisees, their teams, on how to do effective hybrid work and effective remote work. Both of these is important, but especially hybrid work because people are not used to it. So if you, to the extent that you're doing hybrid work, you really want to give them a training like this one, well, somewhat more in depth and customized to your organization, of course, but you want to give them an effective training on how to do hybrid work, what to do at home, what to focus on the office, these collaborative activities. I didn't go into a lot of things that I would do in the half day training, like how to innovate effectively in a virtual environment and in a hybrid environment, because you have a lot of different ways that you need to innovate. 
That is one of the concerns. How do you replace those hallway conversations? Definitely doable. You want to have effective innovation strategies. How do you do mentoring? You want to make sure to be able to do that. Hybrid workplaces have a lot of challenges with that as the remote ones. How do you do on the job training? I talked about the digital co-working. There are other strategies. How do you do team building? So there are lots of things that need to be trained for on how to do effective hybrid work and effective remote work because companies have really not figured it out during more than a year and a half of corporate. So an effective virtual communication and collaboration as all part of this. This is a big, big challenge. Communicating virtually is something, I mean, I'm shocked by how few companies invested into this. You see before COVID, companies paid a lot of money for effective for communication training for their teams, for teamwork, collaboration training for their teams. But collaborating and communicating virtually is very different than communicating and collaborating non-virtually in the office, the normal way that we are used to. That's kind of the, the previous status quo until that people want to get back to and they won't. But companies are not investing in this. And this is pretty silly because it's so important to help people know how to collaborate, whether the digital co-working, the virtual water cooler, other methods of collaboration, communication, how to read people and communicate in virtual settings. All of those are very difficult things that we're not used to and people make a lot of mistakes about. Now, let's do another poll. And I'm curious if you think it would be good for your organization, for your members of your team to benefit from professional development on improving the hybrid work, virtual communication, virtual collaboration. Please go ahead and vote. Great, five more seconds. I see that most of you participated. Well, over three quarters. All right, so see overwhelmingly that over 90% of you would definitely want professional development. And this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about that's really important for effectiveness. I and mean, this is a one-time transition that we're doing that's huge for the future of work. And this gives a huge boost to productivity, to engagement, to communication, collaboration going forward. All right. So takeaways from this presentation, from this key inflection in the future of work. You want to integrate addressing decision-making cognitive biases into your organizational culture, make it part of your systems, part of your processes, if you want to optimize business outcomes on the future of work, even though it might not be personally comfortable for you or for your leaders. Use a team-led hybrid first model with a minority fully remote. It will get your retention of best talent, poach competitor talent who are leaving large firms who are not doing very well on this team-led hybrid first model. Address those long tail risks of variance and other problems. And you want to adapt your culture to collaborate everywhere. You want to measure those deliverables, that collaboration, that performance measurement. And to the extent that you personally or your immediate leadership have flexibility to adopt some of these methods, you can start doing so immediately after this talk and start bringing these methods to your leadership. And you can gain competitive advantage internally and externally to thrive on the skin inflection on the future work. So that's the takeaways. Now, the three additional resources that I mentioned, you'll get my copy of my best-selling book, Returning to the Office, Benchmarking to Best Practices for Competitive Advantage, and a free coaching session, which is available for the first three claimants. You'll get an email, just click on the email. There's a link there. If you can click on the link and claim it, then it's still available. So first come, first serve, of course. And let's do a final poll on those who would like these resources. In the meantime, I'll be happy to take any questions. Dr. Gleb, thank you so much. This was great. Um, really fantastic. So um, a lot of the stuff you said, you said like uh, there are no questions in the chat, but 
as you had said, um, the questions I had noted, you pretty much answered them throughout the presentation, which was great. Um, you know, I'm from Robert Half, and uh, we did a survey, you know, similar um, of uh, leaders around uh, the country, and very, very similar, you know, outcomes. You know, 75% of people want some sort of remote work environment, you know, and, and uh, whether it's hybrid or fully remote, uh, you know, so I thought that was really nice to see that, mm -hmm. you know, that can, your surveys concur with that. Yeah. Um, what I, I really found was interesting, the, the comment you made about the equipment for the employees, mm -hmm. that the employee, you know, they may not care so much, they have a great internet, or they have good lighting, or because it's not so much that they don't care, but you know, they're almost happier. Maybe you can't see me really well, or <laughs> you know, things like that. Well, so they don't I thought care that was, to spend money, <laughs> right? Exactly for the money part of it, right? I thought that was a really a very uh, good point. And then one of the, the challenges I think a lot of people are facing are on the training side in terms of new employees, mm -hmm. how to get them up to speed virtually. Yeah. Um, the equipment's really important in that case because you need you want to be able to see them and be able to show them what you know the work they're doing and. So I think that's a big challenge, and I, I think it's really important what you said about training the the employees on how to you know work remotely and work hybrid. I think that was something I hadn't really thought of, um, mm. and that was a really great point. And then my my um, the personal chat, um, you know, I'm reaching out to colleagues that virtual water cooler. Yeah. You know, I think about it, and I think that you know I, there are a lot of people probably I have not really been in contact with unless I needed to. Yeah. You know, so you think back about when we were in the office and, you know, and those people that we go in on different days sometimes, things like that. It's a really nice thing to be able to reach out to the people, um, yeah. you know. So I really loved uh, all of that. It was really great. Just everything was, was great. We do have a question in the chat. Do you want to do the poll first and then I'll go to that? And or you have, do you need to respond to the poll? I think the poll oh, you is for you, right? That's yeah, that's that's okay. that's, that's for me. Okay. I, mean, I, I can share the results if folks want. So okay, wow, well, look at that. How will resources. how will you get that book to those folks that I'll, are looking for? It? Yeah, I'll just email it so that, that I should okay. have folks' as emails from the Zoom, and I'll just email it to those who want. Wonderful. Yep. So we'll make sure we get you that information. So mm -hmm. thank you. So the first question was how are customers reacting to remote workers in the service industry and employees when their payroll or HR departments are working remote? Hmm. That, that's not a problem at all from in HR and payroll is a wonderful candidate for fully remote work because people are able to, the payroll, much of it is able to be done fully remotely. Of course, you, need, you may need some people on staff if you don't do direct deposit to if you are sending checks, but in HR, large, the larger majority of the work can be fully remote. Some of the work may need to be beneficially done in the office, kind of more sensitive conversations. But I find that it's, it's very doable to have that. So yeah, you, that's not a problem at all. Do you find the customers are even noticing that people are working remotely? Or do you think the customers of those clients, like let's say a payroll service, do you think the customers even realize that they're remote? Let's see. I do not think that the customers realize that they're remote, except in the situations where they see uh, an employee's dog walking into the room. <laughs> <laughs> well, the barking, which I tend to have. Yes, I'm surprised yes, I have yes. a sleeping dog right now. Um, so that's a great question. Actually, the other our comments, um, very informative. Oh, well, let me go back. David, did that answer your question? Um, just let us know. Yes, he wrote, thank you. Very informative. So that's great. Uh, Judy, that was a great session. Thank you, Elizabeth, very informative. The points were very similar to our existing culture and planning. Thank great. you very much. Um, another thank you very really was really informative. Thank you. So um, before I let everyone go, this was really terrific. Again, Dr. Gleb, we really appreciate uh, you. Uh, your um, credentials are fantastic. Um, you know, wow, like I can't even believe you're you've done all of that in your lifetime like you. <laughs> you've really you. really been I mean that nice successful career and good for you that's wonderful um, f finally um, I just want to talk a little bit regarding the Long Island chapter uh, of the American Peril Association we um, 
would like, you know, for future topics, this was really, you know, one of those topics we probably wouldn't have thought of, or, you know, uh, with regard to payroll, but it, it does apply to everyone. So I think that was great. But if there are any other topics anyone wants, please uh, send an email to the LIAPA chapter at gmail.com. I'll say it again in a minute. Um, but any other topics you'd like to see, payroll related, and maybe even non-specific to payroll, if it applies to everyone. Um, also, the board uh, could always use volunteers. And again, it does, you don't have to be a board member. You could be a committee member. You could be just someone that could help out with one task. Uh, we welcome that. You know, social media um, and things like that, we would really love to, to, to broaden in the organization and think that would help everyone. So if anyone's interested in, in helping us with that, um, and we also will have some new board openings in January. So we welcome you to kind of reach out to us uh, for that as well. So if you're interested in anything like that, you can either call uh, Miriam, you could call me, you could call Carlos or email us, or you can email, like here's the email address again. I'll put it in the chat as well, li for Long Island, APA chapter at gmail.com, L-I-A-P-A chapter at gmail.com. And don't forget, if you're interested in Dr. Gleb's uh, free coaching session, you can make a note here, or you could feel free to contact us and we will reach out to him for you as well. Um, I think that's a fantastic offer uh, that some people should definitely take advantage of. Um, and I think you see some of the notes uh, along the way we have a great group of people, great group of uh, um, members who've been with us, some of them for many, many years, and uh, we're thankful for you guys uh, for being here with us today. Any final comments, Dr. Gleb? I'm really glad that this session was helpful, and I look forward to future engagement and commentary. Great. All right, Thank everyone. You. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.